Grace and peace to you, and welcome to Lexington Presbyterian Church on this seventh Sunday of the season of Easter. It's indeed a pleasure to have each of you worshiping with us here in person in the sanctuary or by Zoom and YouTube. So we hope that you find God's presence and peace in worship today. There are several announcements that need to be made this, uh, this morning. Uh, our listening sessions continue this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We have seven folks uh, signed up for those, so if you are wanting to uh, attend those, please come. They'll be in Dunlap this afternoon at 4 o'clock and then again at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Then there'll only be two sessions left next Sunday and Monday, so uh, time's running out. Also this afternoon, uh, Faith Villagers uh, will meet, uh, weather permitting, at 3 o'clock to chalk the church. And uh, if... Uh, the weather does not permit, you will be notified by email? Email, okay, so check, uh, be checking your email. It's three o'clock this afternoon, weather permitting. Also, our Pentecost offering, uh, we'll be taking that up uh, today, and so you can find those envelopes available in the uh, narthex and also in the handicap access area out here. On June the 6th, uh, we will have our summer schedule and our worship will begin at 10 a.m. So June the 6th at 10 a.m. So please make your notes uh, for that. Let us now call ourselves to worship. We are together today because Christ has claimed us. We are called to be the body of Christ in today's world. Who are we to make such a claim? Who would see Jesus Christ when they look at us? We have been called by Christ for a mission. The gathered community is sent out into the world. We are here to be equipped for ministry. We have been closed as apostles of good news. Let us pray together. Watch over us, holy okay. God as we take time to pray and to meditate on the continuing impact of Easter on our lives. Jesus Christ has become for us the measure of life. He represents to us your gift of love and eternal life. We are a resurrection people, no longer bound by fear of death, but free to become witnesses to the light. Nourish us to become like trees planted beside streams of water that nourish and bear much fruit because of our constant attention 
and abundant provision for our needs. Be known to us here in this hour. Amen. Let us stand for Open My Eyes That I May See. You may be seated. Let us go before the Lord with humility and confess our sins. First, together by reciting the unison prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Then we will observe silence for your own personal repentance. Let us pray. We have been called together into the church to live the resurrection faith, to embody Easter and touch lives as Jesus did. We have not done this well. Our vision has been narrowed and limited. Our testimony has been timid and self-protective. We listen to the wrong advisors and complain when things do not go our way. Forgive our limited commitment and low expectations that deny the body of Christ as the strong force for good that we are meant to be. Help us discover the delight and joy of full commitment, we pray. Amen. Beloved, we are no longer blown about in the winds of the world. We are grounded yesterday, today, tomorrow in God's forgiveness, hope, and love. Today and tomorrow, forever, we can bear fresh fruit sharing God's peace and joy with everyone we meet. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen.
are washed in the waters of God's amazing grace, let us share the good news of God's love for us. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. Peace. 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 Peace, everybody. Good morning. Peace, everybody. Peace. 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 Or is this just one? Oh, no, there are two of these. There's David. There's Poppy. Two.
Amen, and thank you. What a blessing. What a blessing. Speaking of blessings, we have come to the time in our uh, worship service that we will bless our offerings. Please join me in prayer. Most holy God, thank you. Thank you for all the gifts you bestow. And now we get to dedicate our gifts as a sign of our gratitude for creating us to care for one another. We pray your blessings upon all the gifts that have been gathered and hope that they serve as our love for you and the world redeeming God. We ask that these gracious offerings be a witness to your healing and faithful love in order to bring hope to a hurting world. It is in the name of the Holy One, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive thy good word and proclamation so that we are moved towards you and towards a deeper commitment to share your good news with the world. This we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning to my young friends in the house and of course all of you at home and everyone who's young at heart today is a special day in the life of the church today on behalf of the congregation i will distribute new bibles to our rising third through fifth graders these young people are ready to transition from the younger Bible we use called God's Love. This is a story-based picture Bible. And now move on and ahead to the Deep Blue Bible, which is a more demanding student Bible. The Deep Blue Bible that they will receive today is translated in common English. It is engaging in an interactive Bible. It offers icons and illustrations to help our young people visualize the text. It offers scripture notes, devotionals, trivia, and other interactive learning tools. It is a great Bible for our young people. We have eight students ready for this transition. Four are at home and will receive their Bibles by delivery. That is Harry Klein, Vivian Carico, Grace Jensen, and Sloan Reed. And then it is our pleasure to have William Kesey, Ian Johnson, Ravi Fury, and Avery Woody with us in the sanctuary today. And I must say to you all, you are a sight for all our sore eyes. We miss kids in the church very, very much. Well, today is a special day for you, and I'm gonna have you come forward now, and I would like you to face yourselves out. So William, will you kind of come up, please? Very good. Robbie and Avery. And where's Ian? There he is. Hi, come on up. Whoop.
Well, as I said, Pastor Kelly, and you guys can turn and face me first, and then we'll do that, that uh, presentation. Okay, so as I said, today is a very special day for you. You are receiving a new Bible, and the Bible, as you know, is whose story? What do you think? Whose story is the Bible? God's story. Thank you, William. The, it is God's story. And as we gift this Bible to you, we are doing so that you get to engage in God's story in a brand new way. You are going to have so many tools available to you in this Bible. And the best part of all, it teaches us not only about the great and wondrous work of God, it teaches us about his son, Jesus Christ, right? And you all know that. So I am so excited to give you this Bible. And then we're going to have ourselves a prayer. Now, I'd like you to take your Bibles and face the congregation and hold them in your hand, in the palm of your hand. Great. All right. And let us all play, pray. Blessed be your name, O Lord, our God. You are the source of every blessing. You have revealed yourself to your human creation in many diverse ways. Our memory of your revelation is maintained and reverenced in the scriptures of the Holy Bible that these children hold in their hands. Look with delight upon us today as we together renew our commitment to read and remember your, you in the stories of our salvation. Help us to absorb what is in this good work, bringing forth us wisdom and to live with its inspired truth. Encourage us with the help of the Holy Spirit to use these Bibles for our prayer and inspiration, to increase our own faith and devotion, and for the building up of your kingdom. Through your word, may we be transformed into the very likeness of Christ, the resurrected one, your son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here today. And you can go sit with your parents now. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I remember when I got my first Bible, I was uh, raised... Uh, Catholic, and at my first Holy Communion, I was given a teeny tiny white Bible with the teeny tiny print in it, and I was uh, I was overjoyed. Bibles have become more friendly now for our young people, and this one is uh, exceptional. And we give great thanks to you, the congregation for allowing us uh, the, in children's mini to, ministry to present these Bibles to our rising third through fifth graders. Amen. The first reading today is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. 
Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Kellyanne. I challenge you to read scripture from that little Bible one Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Our Old Testament lesson this morning is uh, the first psalm, and it occupies one of the most pivotal places of all Scripture as the introduction of the Psalter, which is undeniably the premier devotional text in Judeo-Christian tradition. It's fitting, then, that given this context, that the compiler of the Psalter did not choose to begin with a psalm whose words cited David as its author or gave instructions for musicians or singers. Rather, this psalm, and with it the whole Psalter, begins with devotional instructions on what it takes to live a holy life. And so hear now the word of God beginning in the first verse. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you hear the words moon and stars, you probably think about the night sky, astronomy, or space exploration. What you probably don't ponder is watermelons. Moon and stars is the name of a particularly valuable dark green spotted variety of watermelon. It has yellow specks called stars and larger spots called moons. At one point, this moon and stars variety was feared to be lost forever. But then a group of seed savers pinned down a man who was still growing it. Because of the seeds obtained from him, this melon has been brought back from the brink of extinction to the full bloom of commercial success. The return of moon and stars was a major melon moment, especially to gardeners who are a part of the world of seed savers and heirloom seeds. An heirloom seed is a type of seed that has been passed down through several generations, usually transmitted by seed savers who want to keep a distinctive variety alive. Heirloom seeds are planted by people who want to enjoy fruits and vegetables that are a taste of the past, if you will. These seed savers know that many varieties of crops, although cherished and maintained for generations, have been lost in recent years because fewer and fewer people save seed from year to year. Such gardener, gardeners believe that their heirlooms have better taste and tenderness than the varieties that have been selected for qualities such as ease of shipping or uniform appearance or ability to grow well across the country. These heirloom seeds are valuable and seed savers passionately pursue them. Now you can't find them in most seed catalogs. Instead, you must acquire them from other collectors. Typical searcher searches will include a Wisconsin woman looking for a white pole bean. 
handed down in her family for 87 years until the seed was destroyed in a fire. Or an Oregon resident wanting a bird egg bean dating back to at least 1918. When Leslie and I were in Tupelo, Mississippi, First Presbyterian Church had a member who was a master gardener who was growing black crim and yellow pear, two heirloom tomatoes. And she gave me all this background information from which I just told you. And she grew them successfully and continues to share her heirloom seeds. It's certainly true that heirloom seeds have priceless genetic traits. When old varieties of food crops are not maintained, the gene pool for a crop grows smaller and smaller, and this could lead to increased disease and pest problems, unless some of those old traits are reintroduced. And so heirloom crops are not only delicious by themselves, but they can enhance an entire community by protecting it from disease and destruction. Now, I know all of you know the gardener's prayer. I found it, and it is uh, from anonymous source, and it's, it goes like this. I plant the seed. You make it grow. You send the rain, O oh God. I work the hoe. <laughs> my, pr my premise today is that the church is like a bag of heirloom seeds. Its thing is mission, not melons. Although the psalmist in our text today does mention the trees planted by the streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves do not wither. In other words, the psalmist is describing what we could call an heirloom tree giving off heirloom seeds. And we should be careful to pass on the same genetic material that makes these righteous trees righteous to the generations that follow us. So what are the characteristics of these heirloom trees that the psalmist uses as a simile for the righteous person? And how do we preserve these qualities in future generations? The first heirloom quality is expressed in the negative, and the second is in the positive. Righteous people see themselves as against or apart from the culture. They also attend to the word of God. The righteous are described by three negatives. They do not follow the advice of the wicked. They also do not take the path that sinners tread. And finally, they do not sit in the seat of scoffers. There are a number of approaches uh, a Christian can adopt toward the culture. We can accommodate, we can assimilate, or we can agitate. In other words, we can try to get along and go along with the culture to avoid seeming anachronistic. Or we can completely internalize the culture so that a, a Christian in the culture is in, indistinguishable from the unbeliever. Or we see ourselves as fundamentally in conflict with the culture as other and apart. The psalmist seems to suggest that the righteous person is one of this latter group. His roots do not sink into the culture, but into Torah, which brings us to the second heirloom quality of the righteous person. Righteous people delight in the law of the Lord, and on his law, they meditate day and night. This means that Bible study must remain a foundational discipline for the body of Christ. Study that involves a passionate and persistent investigation of what God is saying to us today through the ancient words of Scripture. On this basis alone, it's fair to say that the church is facing a desperate shortage of righteous people and is therefore in dire need of some heirloom seeds because when it comes to a knowledge of Scripture, the current generation as well as the one that preceded it is fairly illiterate. We may have the persona of serious students of the Bible, but as they say in Texas about cowboy wannabes, this is, this is for you, Weezies, big hat, no cattle. <laughs> now, several years ago, and I'm dating myself here, Jay Leno moved into his audience one night to ask some questions about the Bible. 
Well, they didn't fare too well. He says, name one of the Ten Commandments. God helps those who help themselves, someone ventured. (laughs) Name one of the apostles. No one could. Finally, he asked them to name the Beatles. And the answer came ringing forth from the crowd, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Now, granted, Leno's live audience is not your typical church crowd. One study reported recently that fewer than 16% of Christians read the Bible every day. Now, this does not bode well for the church that would prosper in all that they do. We need to retrieve some heirloom seeds to recover the righteous person, that person who is willing to agitate against the culture and who is grounded in the Word of God. Such discipline is reminiscent of Aristotle's concept of virtue. Aristotle thought of virtue as a state of character gained by repeatedly performing good actions. And Thomas H. Groom, no relation, former professor at Boston uh, College, called virtue an acquired excellence of character that renders a person capable over the long haul of believing in certain reliable ways. As Christians, we want to be reliably tender and compassionate and loving. And the best way to achieve this is through day-to-day practice, repetition, and hard work, always making an effort to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Best of all, this active and visible lifestyle does an excellent job of communicating value to the next generation. Young people are always looking for role models, and they will naturally imitate adults who show admirable patterns of behavior. Whether we demonstrate fidelity in marriage, an appreciation for education, a commitment to generous giving, or a pattern of compassion toward our neighbors, children will watch us and imitate us and receive the characteristics of whatever seed we transfer to them. Another point, heirloom seeds are not meant to be hoarded. They're designed to be shared and multiplied and passed through the generations. And finally, the seed that we save and share should have spiritual disease resistance. Now, this is derived from passionate spirituality and vibrant community life in a church where people focus on Jesus Christ, enjoy hospitality and laughter, and experience loving relationships. In most congregations, this is going to happen best through healthy small groups, men's breakfasts, Sunday school classes, youth group, and on and on. Gatherings in which people can be honest with each other, provide support for each other, and share each other's burdens and joys. When people concentrate on Jesus Christ and on community, there's almost no limit to their potential for growth and fruitfulness. The first Psalm says that the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. This is a vision of vitality. The the seeds of such trees are worth saving and sharing with others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand for how happy are the saints of God.
standing. Let us affirm our faith together, reciting the affirmation of faith that is printed in your bulletin. This is the Lexington Presbyterian Mission Statement. Please join me. We believe God intends for us to be sound in our faith, our service to one another, and our mission to our Lord Jesus Christ beyond our walls and doors. Our task is to understand, embrace, rejoice in, and share that intention. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. God of wisdom, power, and majesty, who are we that, we that you should look with favor upon us? Yet you have written your law upon our hearts that we may know of your righteousness. You sent the prophets. They teach us obedience. Your spirit guides us. We have assurance that you will never forsake us. Christ Jesus reveals all that we know of you. We give you thanks for his redeeming love in spite of our wayward behavior. We claim the benefits of his sacrifice on our behalf. Help us to be still, O oh God, so that we can hear you speak. Amid the babble of human speech, teach, give us ears to listen to your voice. As demands are made and pressure mounts, put us at ease and sustain us by your presence. As we meditate on the love of Jesus, may the hope he gives be a haven of rest and renewal. Oh Lord, help us to find the discipline to be more faithful. Time passes quickly and our tasks are undone. Translate our desires into commitment and keep us from putting off decisions that demand energy and effort. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us when the way seems unsure and instill within us that measure of confidence that will enable us to act. O oh God, enlighten us with your wisdom. Awaken us to the abiding testimony of your covenant. Illumine the dark places of our nagging doubts. By your power, O oh Lord, make us bolder and better disciples. Give us the courage to forsake the easy life and risk personal security so that others may learn of your love. In your majesty, keep us ever conscious of our dependence on you and ready to give you praise. We're grateful that you are a God who hears our prayers and we lift up to you this day all those who are broken in body, mind, and spirit. You know each and every one by name and you know their needs even before they reach our tongues. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand for I sing a song of the saints of God.
Go forth from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord, always rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forever. Amen. Happy Sunday, y'all.